so hard to live in what the things you do to me Oh, why do you get so strange? I like to tell you everything I see At one. Oh yeah, it was like lightning. Everybody was fighting, and the music was soothing, and they all started grooving. And the man at the back said, "Everyone attack!" And they turned into a ballroom blitz. And the girl in the corner said, "Why am I the one you're gonna turn into a ballroom blitz? Ballroom blitz, ballroom blitz, ballroom."
bottle standing there Found my transcendent It played in mono painted blue You were the hero I was the dark room I'm a shine of light in your eyes You probably shine it back live stream today we bring you the second of three live streamed cross usa lectures from tim stark of the university of illinois my name is brad keeler i'm the director of the geo institute and we are thrilled to have you along you may have noticed if you live in the northern hemisphere and you have been outside or looked outside or thought about going outside that it is summertime that does not mean that we get quiet at the Geo Institute. Oh, no. In 2020, when things were a little bit different, we started live streaming some of our Cross USA lectures throughout the summer, and it worked so well that we thought we are going to start doing this every year. And as long as the lecturer agrees to it, and they usually do, that is the way it's gone. We have our lecturer pick a couple of different topics that they didn't talk about at any of their lectures throughout the year, in person or remote, and we let them roll. So again, here you are on the YouTube channel. You found us. If you like what you see today, and I think you will, you should do a few things. You should click like, subscribe, get notifications. And if you do those things, we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. If you don't know anything about the Geo Institute, we can fix that as well. After you watch this today, you should head over to geoinstitute.org, and there you will find out all kinds of amazing things about us, that we are a technical society with about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists, and that we are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. You will also notice, perhaps, that I have donned a Geo Congress 2023 student competition shirt today. If you would like to support our student programs and get your very own Carl Terzaghi bobblehead or a pair of very cool Geo Institute socks, you can head over to geoinstitute.org and click on support student programs and do that as well. The Carl Terzaghi bobblehead and the socks are just $96 gift from you and they will be coming your way as long as you live in North America. We have one more thing to do before we get to the official intro for Tim. We are very pleased to have GeoPeer sponsor the Cross USA lecture this year. And so we have a short message from them. Thanks again to GeoPeer for their generous sponsorship this year of the Cross USA Lecture. Now, to tell you a little bit more about it, to tell you a little bit more about our lecturer, and maybe a little bit about himself, I don't know, I don't really know. That's GI <laughs> Past President Bob Gilbert of the University of Texas. Bob, thank you for doing this, and take it away. Thank you, Brad. So we at the Geo Institute are really proud of the Cross USA lecture. This is uh, uh, 
activity that we've been hosting since 2010 in which we pick a distinguished geoprofessional and they spend the year going across the United States giving lectures. And this year's distinguished geoprofessional is Tim Stark. Tim Stark is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with an expertise in geotechnical engineering. He's been conducting research and teaching on slope stability and seepage related problems for over 30 years. He's received a number of awards for his research, teaching, and service activities, including the Norman Medal from the American Society of Civil Engineers for the top paper in all of civil engineering. And Tim is going to tell us a little bit about cement bentonite and jet grout cutoff wall performance. Tim, take it away. Thanks so much, Bob. Okay. Now, can you see my display? We can. Perfect. Thanks so much, Bob. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today for the second virtual Cross USA lecture. Today's topic, cement bentonite and jet ground cutoff wall performance. I'd like to acknowledge my two collaborators, Phil Colon of P. Colon Construction Consultants, Inc. in Toronto, and Karsten Beckhaus of Bauer Specialized Foundation contractors in Germany. We've drafted a paper. It's been through a couple reviews. You can see the title page on the screen. We hope to have that submitted here shortly. So if you would like more details, please email me and I'll send you a draft version of the paper. Okay, so here's the outline for today's presentation, five main topics. So starting with background. The cutoff wall system had a contract length of about 1.4 miles and the as-built ended up to be about 1.3 miles. So it's a pretty significant cutoff wall system. There are three parts to the system, a cement bentonite part, and that was roughly between as-built about 1,300 meters long, infilled jet grout about 120 meters, 121 meters long of jet grout. And then there's about 525 meters of soft columns, which are the transition between the cement bentonite panels and the infill jet grout. The cutoff wall, the cement bentonite cutoff wall is about 26 meters deep or 85 feet deep. The jet grout, infill jet grout about 23 and a half or 77 feet deep and the soft columns um, similar to the cement bentonite cutoff of about 26 meters or 85 feet deep. So a pretty significant cutoff system. And that was needed for a large subway station. You can see on the left, fairly deep station, as you can see. And some issues with dewatering developed early in the excavation. And you can see some of that on the right. So the design, and these are the summary of the dewatering issues, the design called for 15.5 meters of drawdown inside the station to keep the work area dry, but only less than one meter of drawdown outside the cutoff wall. So the wall was supposed to basically seal the excavation from the outside groundwater regime. <clears throat> However, the measured drawdown outside the cutoff wall system ranged from about 9 to 15.5 meters. So there was a significant drawdown outside of the station. And here's some piezometer data that shows the upper dashed blue line is the initial groundwater at about 199.5 meters. The design draw drawdown outside the system should be less than one meter. So it should have all these piezometer readings should have stayed right in this band of one meter. However, you can see a lot of these piezometers have significant drawdown from, say, roughly 200 down to about 180, 184 meters, so a significant drawdown. All of these piezometers are south of the highway. I'm going to show you in just a minute. The excavation's broken into two parts, south of the, uh, the highway that I'll show you and north of the highway. 
The bottom of the cutoff wall system is elevation 176, so this dashed red line. So this was the idea that cutoff wall would come down to 176, isolate the excavation from the groundwater system outside of the excavation. <clears throat> In addition to the large drawdown outside of the excavation, the pumped water volume that was having to be dealt with inside the excavation was about two to two, two to five times the design volume to achieve the drawdown inside the station of 15.5 meters. In addition to the extra volume of pumped water, it took seven to eight months to achieve the 15.5 meters of drawdown inside the station instead of 30 days. And of course that had a big impact on the construction schedule and so on. So that's why there was interest in understanding how the cement bentonite wall system was performing and constructed. So let me talk about the design and construction first, and then the, the real crux of the presentation is bullet number three is the investigation that we conducted to investigate the integrity of the cutoff wall system. So the design, this is the segment that's south of the highway. So here's the highway, and this highway splits the excavation into two pieces, and they are two separate pieces. They're they're not connected. These little circles that the blue arrows are pointing to are the areas of infill jet grout that was used in these particular locations. There's some other locations everywhere you see a circle, like here, here, here. I didn't want to put blue arrows all over it. But that's where the infill jet grout is used where utilities cross the cutoff wall. The other, the rest of the blue line that you see here, here is the cement bentonite cutoff wall system. Okay, and there's more jet grout, infill jet grout south of the highway than north of the highway. That'll be important as well as the large drawdown that you saw previously south of the highway, drawdown outside the excavation south of the highway. So that both of those pieces will be very important in just a minute. Okay, so here's a look at the south of the highway and some of the dewatering activities. You can see some of the well points and dewatering wells around the site. And those are trying to lower the groundwater within the station. Now shifting to north of the highway. So notice the highway now is on the left instead of the right. So a much larger area for the excavation north of the highway. And you can see a very elongated rectangle north and primarily the cutoff bentonite wall was used north. There are some of the jet grout locations north of the highway, but there is more jet grout south of the highway than north of the highway. The cutoff wall here is 26 meters deep and it's about 0.6 meters wide, which is the width of the clamshell bucket that was used to excavate the panels for the cutoff wall. Here's a picture north of the highway showing the dewatering, um, the dewatering trailers down here and some well draw, drawdown wells around the excavation, but a much larger area north of the highway. Okay, requirements of the cutoff wall for the contract. The cement bentonite had to have a maximum hydraulic conductivity. In other words, the hydraulic conductivity through the cement bentonite. The maximum value had to be less than one times 10 to the eight minus eight meters per second. The cutoff wall width had to be sufficient to maintain a head differential of 16 meters from outside to inside. The toe embedment of the cutoff, the cement bentonite cutoff wall had to be the deeper of elevation 176 or a minimum of three meters into the clayey lower till, which I'll show you in just a minute. Some other properties of the cement bentonite, the marsh funnel and the bentonite 
water ratio, as you can see here, and then the water cement ratio as well. OK, so the cement bentonite construction occurred between 2011 and 2012. Each panel, as you can see in this diagram, here's a panel like right there. So P546 to 545. Each panel has a length of 3.2 meters. There's an overlap of each panel of 0.6 meters. Because, and that's what this little rectangle is. If you show, there's a typical overlap right over here. So each panel was overlapped 0.6 meters, and each panel is 2.2 uh, meters. So you add 2.2 together and you take 0.6 off each end, and that's how you get to a 3.2 meter long panel. In between, the panels, you can see jet grout columns. And so this is a location where some utilities crossed the cutoff wall system and the jet grout was used to complete the wall where the utilities were pre pre present. OK, so here's the infill jet grout. This is south of the highway, and this is similar to the drawing I showed you earlier. These circles are the infill jet grout. And these are at locations where the utilities penetrated the cement bentonite cutoff wall. The minimum column diameter is 1.6 meters, and a single fluid jet grout process was used. So only single fluid jet grout, not double or triple, single fluid. The requirements of the jet grout are the average hydraulic conductivity of the jet grout had to be less than one times 10 to the minus seven meters per second. So one order of magnitude higher than the cement bentonite. In addition, the maximum hydraulic conductivity of the jet grout had to be less than or equal to 10 to the minus seven. And that term, that's the control, that was the control, so the maximum value of the hydraulic conductivity through the jet grout is going to control. And again, it's 10 times higher than the cement bentonite. The columns had to be overlapped at least a half a meter. And the toe embedment of the columns is one meter into lower permeability soils. So, OK, unconfined compressive strength of greater than two megapascals. OK, so let's shift to the stratigraphy and why is all of that important? Here's a cross section along the station, and this is the cement bentonite wall down to elevation 176, so well into the lower till, and in particular, what I'll show you in a minute, some stiff gray clay. And here's the other side or the east side of the cement bentonite wall down to 176. So for the design, the drawdown inside the station is 15.5 meters. And outside the station, right here, this water level would not drop more than a meter. So 15.5 there, and the wall designed to 176. OK, so here's the actual condition or measured drawdown, and this is the difference. Here's the initial groundwater, but south of the highway, you can see the measured drawdown significantly deeper than one meter. Here's the jet grout setup and configuration of the infill areas and the measured drawdown. So the gray vertical lines is the infill jet grout down to lower permeability soils. So notice that a higher elevation than the tip of the cement bentonite cutoff wall. And that's the west side and here's the east side. And the drawdown outside the jet grout being significantly greater than one meter. And that is reflected in the piezometer data that I showed you in slide three or four. OK, so with that. Lack of getting to 15.5 meters in 30 days and a significantly greater volume, an investigation into the cutoff wall was undertaken. 
And this, this investigation was to try to determine if the cutoff wall was integral. In other words, was it continuous? Was it uniform? Was it in place and able to keep the groundwater out of the excavation? So the investigation has three main parts, nine core borings. And so these are borings in which we cored either the jet grout or the cement bentonite. 14 sonic borings, two of these in jet grout, one of these in cement bentonite. If I go back to the core borings, seven of the nine core borings are vertical and two are inclined, which is very important. The two inclined core bor borings allowed to check the overlap and continuity between the jet grout and the cement bentonite. So there are five vertical and one inclined in the jet grout or infill jet grout, and one vertical and one inclined in the cement bentonite. So I see that two, six, oh, three, two, so two vertical and one inclined in the cement bentonite for a total of nine. 14 sonic borings, two in jet grout, one in cement bentonite. So the other 11 are borings just outside of the wall so we could determine the soil stratigraphy and figure out where the bottom or toe embedment of the cutoff wall system was located. Finally, 20 hydraulic conductivity or commonly referred to as Packard tests were conducted in the some of the core borings that I mentioned before. So on the right is a photograph. The rig on the left is the coring rig, and the rig on the right is the sonic boring rig, and you can see them unloading a sonic core into the plastic bag right there. Okay, so north of the highway, here are the locations of the sonic borings, vertical borings, and incline borings. So notice both incline borings are right here north of the highway, and sonic borings almost matched up with all of the vertical borings, again, to check the soil stratigraphy right next to the vertical coring, so we knew what the embedment and soils that the wall were going through. Here are the boring locations south of the highway. Similar situation with the vertical borings matched up with sonic borings. A focus area is this lower corner here. You can see many sonic borings and vertical borings because that's where the a number of the piezometers that were showing significant drawdown outside of the wall system are located. So I'll zoom in on these two, the vertical boring and sonic boring. That's the photo I just showed you. Here are the rigs operating, sonic, sonic on the right, core on the left. Okay, so now that we have the borings underway, the four main objectives of the investigation are, check the continuity and uniformity of the cement bentonite and the infill jet grout. I will start with the cement bentonite. Determine the toe embedment, determine the top of the lower till, because that had uh, requirements in terms of toe embedment of the wall. And finally, measure the hydraulic conductivity of the cement bentonite cutoff wall, as well as the infill jet grout. So here we go, we'll do cut off the cement bentonite cutoff wall first. So first is the width of the cement bentonite. So here's an excavation down to the top of the wall. This greenish material right here is the top of the cutoff wall. Pretty amazing, really distinct, clear that the wall was there intact. And you can see me measuring it over here in the upper right. It was greater than 0.6 meters wide, and that was probably due to a little overbreak at the top. But that part of the process of making the wall 0.6 meters wide was, was met. You can see the continuity and uniformity of the top of the wall really nice intact cement bentonite. Okay, so now let's turn to the vertical core borings. 
So this is vertical boring number one in the cement bentonite. So the first run is in the core box on the left, and that's zero to five meters. And you can see a nice continuous core. We wrap them in plastic to maintain the moisture content of the cement bentonite. And the top of the box was placed on and the boxes were all stored in a trailer on the site. The next run is five to 10 meters and core box you can see on in the middle photograph. And then on the right is 15.3 to 18.3. And so in vertical boring number one, uniform and continuous cement bentonite to a depth of 24.2 meters. This is another typical vertical boring in the cement bentonite. So this is uniform and continuous over about 20 meters, 19.8 meters. Here's a close-up of some of the core on the right. Very intact, uniform, continuous cement bentonite. Okay, that brings me to the panel overlaps because that could be a possible source of leakage through the cutoff wall system. So as I mentioned that we drilled two inclined borings. This is the first one. This is, uh, or sorry, second inclined boring number two in the cement bentonite. The drill rig is, the mast of the drill rig is oriented at about 45 degrees. And so the drillers are gonna drill through panels P1, P51 through P54 for a length of about 28 meters. And this was difficult, running a drill rig at an incline, all the drill rod, et cetera, were laying against a drill rig instead of hanging vertical. And so this was really a difficult project for the drillers to do. And they did two of these incline borings. So very much more difficult than a vertical maps. But you can see the continuous core on the left. And this is the end of the core at about 27, 27.7 meters, you can see some clay at the end right here. That's where the boring exited the wall and went into natural material at the end. But the overlaps were continuous and not a source of leakage. In addition to checking the core, we, tele, we used a televiewer in all of the core borings all of the vertical core borings, so seven, seven vertical core borings. So here's the televiewer camera there in my hand right there, it's got a light. And so these are typical photos showing the intact nature of the cord boring. And that was important one to investigate the continuity and uniformity, but also for the Packer test, which I'm going to describe in just a minute. The Packer test, you isolate different parts of the borehole, and then you run a hydraulic conductivity in between the two packers if it's a double packer test. So we wanted to see if the core boring had damaged the sides of the cutoff or the cement bentonite, and they were, that would lead to additional leakage before conducting the packer test. But the teller viewer showed the vertical borings to be really in good shape. Okay, that brings me to toe embedment for cement bentonite. <clears throat> so the contractor field log showed all of the cement bentonite panels extended to the elevation of 176 meters, as I mentioned in the beginning. The only question were four locations, four isolated locations where the clamshell bucket was stopped after about 0.3 to about 10 meters, 9.6 meters, into this stiff gray clay, which I'll show you in just a minute. And the, clay, the clamshell bucket was stopped because of these boulders getting in the way. So given the continuity of the cement bentonite at this point, we decided to drill two of these locations, thinking that the worst potential for the cutoff wall was at these locations where the clamshell hit the boulders, even though we were pretty confident that the cement bentonite would flow around the boulders and so on. We wanted to make sure. So we drilled two of these locations to check the cutoff wall. This is the stiff gray clay. 
uh, very intact, stiff uh, glacial lacustrian clay, it looked like. You can see very continuous intact. Here's the rotosonic continuous sample of the stiff gray clay. So this was really low hydraulic conductivity. So if the cutoff wall extended into this stiff gray clay, it would basically prevent flow from going under the wall because the clay had such a low hydraulic conductivity, uh, much probably an order, one or two orders of magnitude lower than the cutoff wall. So the idea was to key the bottom of the cement bentonite into this stiff gray clay. So let's check how that how well that was accomplished in these two locations where boulders were encountered. So that's vertical boring 1 CB and vertical boring 3 CB. And the sonic borings were used just outside the wall to confirm the stratigraphy. So the depth of toe embedment in the lower till is 4.6 meters and 7.3 for these two locations. But more importantly, the depth of toe embedment in the stiff gray clay that I just showed you is 2.4 and 5.9 meters. So the bottom of the cutoff wall was secured nicely into the stiff gray clay, preventing water from flowing under the wall and into the excavation because of its stiff, low hydraulic conductivity of the clay. So this met the contract specifications. You can see in VB3, the bottom of the cutoff is at 175.9, which is in agreement with the spec of 176 or three meters into the lower till. You can see it's 7.3 meters in the lower till, so that met contract specs. And the other location with the boulders, you can see it made uh, extended 4.6 meters into the lower till. So it also met contract specs. OK, so that brings me to measuring the hydraulic conductivity of the cement bentonite. Last step in the investigation of the cement bentonite, then we'll do the same for the jet brow. So we conducted borehole packer tests using the US Bureau of Reclamation test E-18. Both single and double packer tests were conducted. The, if it was a double, they were conducted over 1.5 meter long intervals. Some of the tests were conducted over the entire length of the cutoff uh, cement bentonite because the boring was in nice condition. So just one packer was used at the top and the whole length of the cement bentonite was tested. The diameter of the test is and boring is 75 millimeters. And there's a packer right here, water level detector and the packer going into the boring. OK, here's some of the instrumentation for the packer test. The calculations I'm going to show you in just a minute used U.S. Bureau of Reclamation document 7310-18, section 14 calculations. And that's how the hydraulic conductivities that I'll show you in just a minute were calculated. OK, so remember the maximum hydraulic conductivity of cement bentonite has to be less than 1 times 10 to the minus 8 meters per second. Here are the results of the Packer tests right there. So you can see in VB1 and VB3, the maximum hydraulic conductivity is right there, 8.2 times 10 to the minus 9. Put it over there on the left so you can see that meets the maximum requirement. Now, if you look at other some of the values of maximum hydraulic conductivity, look, here's one times 10 to the minus 10, another one times 10 to the minus 10. So really pretty good low values of maximum hydraulic conductivity. Now, what do I mean by maximum hydraulic conductivity? So you run the Packer test at different time intervals. So it could be one minute, 10 minutes, and so on. And you measure how much water leaves the packed or isolated area. And so one test could have a number of different trials, and you always use the maximum amount of flow out of that test 
that set of tests to calculate the maximum hydraulic conductivity. So this is the worst hydraulic conductivity measured or the highest for that series of tests. So the column to the left, notice, is the average hydraulic conductivity. So this is, you take all the tests that you run over that particular interval and you average the hydraulic conductivity. So notice the average here is 1.03 times 10 to the minus nine versus the maximum value of 8.2. So there are many values in that, at that depth and that isolated location, notice it's 12.4 meters to 13.9, that are much less than 8.2 times 10 to the minus nine. But we focused on the maximum value. Finally, the median at average hydraulic conductivity is down here at the bottom of the table, 7.41. I'm going to use that in just a minute to calculate the amount of flow through the cement bentonite wall. I'm going to use the median average hydraulic conductivity of the cement bentonite to calculate the flow through the cement bentonite. Okay. So in summary, the cement bentonite portion, continuous, uniform, low hydraulic conductivity, and proper embedment. And here's the television viewer system on in operation. There's a screen here, and we were able to watch the whole process. So at this point, we decided inflow was not occurring through the cement bentonite wall, and thus we focused on the infill jet grout which is next. So here are the objectives for studying or investigating the infill jet grout. Continuity and uniformity of jet grout first. So this is BB number five in jet grout. And the jet grout was found to be uniform and continuous over 17.3 meters of the boring. And so this is a run of the jet grout from 45 to 53. Five feet. So here's 45 to 50, and there's 50 to 55 feet right there, already wrapped up. More importantly, is the core barrel that the driller used is 1.5 meters long, round numbers about four and a half feet. And we frequently got what we called baseball bats out of the core, and that's what I'm holding here. You can see that's essentially an intact core over the majority of the length of the core barrel of 1.5 meters. So that shows the uniformity and continuity of the jet graph that was installed. Okay, just another check. Here's VB6, uniform and continuous, um, over 12.8 meters continuous, the core barrel again, um, 1.5 meters long. So here you go. This is a sample from 50 to 60 feet, and there's a close-up of the jet graph. Okay, this is BB7 in jet grout, 6.7 meters long. So this run here is 25 feet to 30, 7.6 to 9.1, and you can see a continuous core next to it. More importantly, on the left, right there, there's another baseball bat, and that's from a depth of 15.3 to 16.8. Now, let's turn to the incline boring in the jet grout. So this is oriented at 65 degrees instead of 45 like the first one, and that's because we wanted to drill through soft columns two through five and then jet grout columns 34-1 through 34-4. So a incline boring of about 22.3 meters long. And so you can see the mast is tilted back a little bit. The core barrel and drill rod is at an angle going into the first column and that's the soft column. And it's gonna go straight through the soft columns into the jet grout. On the left, you can see the soft columns here. The first column where my pointer is, is this column where the drill rod is. Okay. So in 
incline boring number one and eject route, continuous and uniform. So here's another baseball bat. This is about one meter long core. Remember the core barrel is about 1.5 meters long. And so it wasn't exactly the entire core barrel, but one meter, which was really good because this is the first incline boring that we drilled and the, con the driller was still working out the processes and so on for handling the incline operation. So this was still a really great result that we were able to get one meter of continuous core out of the first incline boring. This also lets me reintroduce my collaborators on the left right here. That's Karsten Beckhouse. In the middle is Phil Kowan. And enjoying the, yep, there they are. One meter long core. And there's the core, the start of the core right there in south column five going this way towards the jet grout after it was filled. Okay. Here's a close up of some of the other core from IB1 jet grout, uniform and continuous. You can see on the left. But more importantly, right there where my finger is, that's the transition from the soft column on the left into the jet grout, right there. That was beautiful. Showed up perfectly right where we thought it was going to be. And you can see good connection between the soft column and the jet grout as the incline boring went through it. So the joints were uniform and continuous as well. Okay, go embedment of the jet grout. So this is a table summarizing what we found. Toe embedment is one meter into low permeability soils or the lower till. And so the column on the right here gives a summary depth of embedment in lower permeability soils or lower till. You can see 2.5, 1.7, 4.95, 2.3 to 8.5. So all of these met the one meter requirement. This one, SB13 jet grout, it had uh, zero meters in the lower till, but it was directly underlain by clay to sandy clay, and we knew that because we had a sonic boring right next to it, and so we knew what the soil type is. So that was good, good toe embedment as well. Okay, so that brings me to the toe embedment and where some of the leakage or extra groundwater was coming in. This is a schematic that shows the cutoff cement bentonite panel 544 on the left and 539 on the right. And in between are these blue jet grout columns right here. So the blue jet grout columns extend one meter into the lower permeability soils or lower till. But notice that stiff gray clay I showed you earlier occurs at a deeper depth. And that's why the toe of the cement bentonite wall goes to elevation 176. So it's in this stiff gray clay. So there's this little zone between the bottom of the jet grout and the top of the stiff gray clay that could be a possible source of flow underneath the jet grout. And this is for the location south of the highway right here in the corner that I mentioned earlier that we focused on because some of the piezometers that I showed early in the presentation that had large drawdowns outside of the station are right in this area. Yeah. Okay, so last piece of the investigation on jet grout is measuring the hydraulic conductivity of the jet grout. So we ran Packer tests as well. The contract spec says the maximum hydraulic conductivity and the average hydraulic conductivity has to be less than um, one times 10 to the minus seven. Here are the results. Maximum hydraulic conductivity 5.87 times 10 to the minus eight, so less than the requirement. There we go. The median average hydraulic conductivity is 4.1 times 10 to the minus nine. Right. 
there. And I'm going to use that to calculate the flow through the jet graph. OK, so anticipated flow through the jet grout and cutoff wall and under. OK, so let's do the flow through the cement bentonite cutoff wall and the jet grout first. So there are two pieces. Let's see the time. OK, um, two pieces. So the left piece is the hydraulic conductivity of the cement bentonite times the gradient through the cement bentonite times the area of the cement bentonite plus the hydraulic conductivity of jet grout plus the gradient times the area. So we add those two together to get the total flow through the cement bentonite cutoff wall system. So here are the parameters if you'd like to follow up on this. There's the median value of hydraulic conductivity from the Packer test for the cement bentonite and the jet grout 4.1. And using the gradient and area, I calculate a total flow through the wall system of about 42 meters cube per day. 42 meters cube per day. The design assumed an inflow of 700 meters cube per day. So what we saw from the Packer test and the hydraulic conductivity measurements, much lower flow through the wall than anticipate. And in fact, the flow or yeah, the flow through the cutoff wall is only about 6% of the design, 42 divided by 700. So pretty good shows the wall was intact and integral. So let me go back to the drawing I showed earlier of the possibility of flow under the jet grout. So if you take this window, which is this orange hatched, hatched zone, and you take the area of that and a range of hydraulic conductivity of one times 10 to the minus four to one times 10 to the minus six, use an average of five minus five, and an average height, you calculate a flow under the jet grout of about 226 meters cubed per day per window. It was thought there were five windows south of the highway, one window north of the highway. So multiplying those by six, 20, 226 times six gives you about 1358 meters cubed per day, right there. So let's compare that to the measured value. So north of the highway, there was one window, about 90 meters squared estimated. So that's what the 626 number is. This is a window of about 32 meters squared. So you can see about three times higher for 90 square meters. And that would be the calculated flow ranges from 226 to about 626. The measured flow north of the highway is 467. So pretty good agreement between the flow estimated and measured under the jet graph, north of the highway. So let's go south of the highway where five windows could have been present. That would give an error of about 115 square meters. And that gives you about 4,390 meters cubed, so the range is 1,000, say 1,100 to about 4,000. The measured steady state pumping rate south of the highway is about 1865. So again, right in between the two. So the important piece is notice that north of the highway, the pumping rate is about four times lower than south of the highway, which explained the larger drawdown south of the highway. OK, and so there's the source. So in summary, the wall was integral, but there were potential for flow under the jet ground, yep, main flow under the jet ground. So in summary, in summary, 
The cement bentonite cutoff wall was continuous, uniform, overlap, embedded in the stiff gray clay, and the hydraulic conductivity of the cement bentonite was lower than required. The infill jet grout was also continuous, uniform, overlapped, embedded in the right proper material, and the hydraulic conductivity was lower than required. So the greater inflow and greater drawdown outside the cutoff wall was not due to flow coming through the wall system. Or in simple terms, the wall was integral, it was continuous and uniform, and so the flow was not coming through. That was only a value of about 42 meters cubed per day, which did not explain the large pumping rate. So that left us with the theory that there was flow occurring underneath the jet ground in especially south of the highway. Okay, uh, I hope we have time for uh, some questions. Thank you, Tim. I'm looking for questions in the chat, um, but I'll go ahead and get started. So. The drawdown outside of the excavations, did it cause problems? Oh, good question. Um, not that I know of. Uh, there, wasn't, there weren't structures immediately adjacent to the excavation, but uh, I'm not aware of any problems outside of the excavation due to the drawdown. Okay, so the concern really was just the volume of flow that they were trying to manage during construction? Yeah, volume of flow and also the time that it took to get the draw, or desired level of drawdown inside the station so the work could proceed took much longer. Okay. We've got a question from Ian Gidley asking were any perms run on the cores that are obtained from the drilling i'm maybe i'll i'll qualify that any any cores from that window from the the till that's between the bottom of the jet crowded columns and the the clay first thing tim can you stop sharing your screen oh sorry thank you that's okay yeah go ahead uh so so the hydraulic conductivity on the material between the bottom of the jet grout and the top of the stiff gray clay? Yeah. Um, no, but there were some estimates of that hydraulic conductivity, and that's why I used the range of 1 times 10 to the minus 4 to 1 times 10 to the minus 6, um, and then the average of that being 1 times 10 to the minus 5 to calculate the flow under the jet grout. Okay. Uh, Bill Stevens is asking, what was the purpose for sonic borings and what was the purpose for Packer testing? Okay, so it's sonic borings first. So the sonic borings, there were two main purposes. One, to check the soil stratigraphy just outside where we were drilling the vertical borings or the incline borings, just so we knew what the soil stratigraphy was right at that location instead of a generalized profile. And that's how we could check the tone embedment and the materials that the cement bentonite and the jet grout were founded in. The sonic borings that were in the cutoff wall itself were bigger diameter samples that we could check the continuity and uniformity of both the cement bentonite and the jet grout. Okay. Uh, we've got a question from Evan Helia Garini saying they saw a 1.8 times 10 to the minus 8 meter per second, I'm assuming, in the maximum hydraulic conductivity. What happened? So maybe they saw an entry in there that was above the specified maximum. Oh, let's see. Um, this is under the maximum? Yes. Okay, I see one, uh, 1 times 10 to the 8, uh, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10. Um, that was Jack Brown. Maybe he's talking about cement bentonite. 
Here we go. Uh, oh, here, yeah, 1.8 times 10 to the minus eight. That's correct. So it was just a shade above one times 10 to the minus eight. And that's the maximum value. The average, of course, is uh, only 2.1 times 10 to the minus nine. So in order, almost an order of magnitude above. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm curious on the maximum, you defined it relative to how you were running the Packer test. Was that how it was defined in the specifications? Yeah, that's, that's how you basically run the Packer test. So you, you take different time intervals and you use the maximum flow to get the maximum hydraulic conductivity. That's set out in those calculations in section 14 of that USBR document. But in the construction specifications, was it defined around running Packer tests or was it defined relative to quality control laboratory tests that were performed on samples from it, the material? Yeah, great, great question. I forgot to mention that. The contract itself required Packer tests. Okay. That's, that's why we had to do the Packer test. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question is, was the purpose of the jet grout cutoff wall sections to seal around conduit penetrations? And did you consider seepage through imperfect seals around these penetrations? So the first question is, yes, the infill jet grout was to secure locations where utilities or pipes or other penetrations went through the wall. Um, the jet grout was pretty uniform, so we did, we thought about possibly leakage around the penetration and the jet grout, but thought the bigger source was below the bottom of the column. Also, another reason why we didn't think that was a concern because the drawdown was so far outside the excavation. Remember, south of the highway, it was almost. Uh, 15, 9 to 15 meters, the utilities were above that location. So there was actually no groundwater at, at the level of those utilities. It had been drawn down outside of the excavation. So as soon as the water level went below the utility, there was really not a potential for that. Right. Serendipitously, I suppose. Um, right. <laughs> and it was Richard Bird who asked that question. Uh, Thomas Fennessy is asking, did you use inclinometers or other methods to check the alignment of the inclined borings? No, just oriented the inclined boring and kept going. So assuming from the surface that it was on a line. Correct. Okay. And that matched up pretty well because we kept getting either a soft column or jet grout back until we finally exited the wall. We may have a leading question here from Canada for generations. The question is, and maybe you can't answer it, what is the location of the project? Uh, somewhere in Canada. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, v Vishu Theology asks, did the preliminary geotechnical, geotechnical investigation not indicate the possibility of increased flow below the design level of the jet grotted wall? Was something missed in the overall site and valuation? I think that's a pretty good question to end on here. Yeah, uh, I want to focus on the wall and, and how really amazing the wall was. I mean, that's 1.4 miles of cutoff wall, and it was continuous, uniform, intact. It was really amazing. And so I'd like to stick to that and not, not get too far into the, the design and what was required and so on. Just the real emphasis is that the cutoff wall was built and, and turned out to be continuous and uniform. Okay. Yeah, Liz Smith, a former Cross USA lecturer, asks a similar question, which is, were you trying to figure out if the design was flawed or if the construction <laughs> was flawed? And I think you've answered that, that you're, you were representing the contractor and looking at this, I'm assuming. Yeah, 
Yeah. Okay. Well, fantastic, Tim. That was a great lecture, a great story, a great case history. Uh, I am amazed how well the cutoff wall looked in all of yeah. the uh, interrogation that you did of it. I can't say I've seen cutoff walls look that nice. So it's a great exactly. story. It's amazing what we can do when things go well. Um, I'm going to kick it back to you, Brad, to wrap up the lecture. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Tim, for another great lecture. That was fantastic. Thanks to everybody watching who submitted questions today. We had so many that we didn't even get to all of them, which doesn't usually happen on these things. So while we're sorry that we couldn't get to everybody, we try to combine and do our best, and we do appreciate you watching. And of course, Tim's not really hard to find. If you have any questions for Please. him that you didn't get addressed today, Here's a hint, Google Tim Stark, Illinois, and click on the first link and his email address is right there on his faculty page that he has at the University of Illinois. Yep. So again, thanks to everybody who watched and asked questions. We really appreciate it. If you liked what you saw, and I always say you're here at the end, so you probably did, you should click like, subscribe, get notifications, and we will let you know every time we post something new to the YouTube channel. We have a couple of big things coming up. The first thing I will say is you can already register for Cross USA lecture number three that Tim will be giving September 7th. So you can head to our Eventbrite page and do that. And while you are there, you'll see we have a couple of live streams from our Geo Risk conference that's coming up next week. And Geostrata Extra is already on the books for August with Alejandro Martinez from UC Davis. He'll be talking about bio-inspired geotechnics. One more reminder to head over to geoinstitute.org and support student programs. We can always use the help. Thanks again to GeoPeer, our excellent sponsor for the Cross USA lecture. We really appreciate the support. The last note is we are coming up on our 100th live stream. Kind of unbelievable. That will be as it's scheduled now for Geostrata Extra in August. So you want to tune in for that one and maybe look for a contest before we do that. And our producer today doing an excellent job as always with Sean Herpelsheimer. So thanks everybody for tuning in and we will see you on another GI live stream soon. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Brad. <laughs>